So good morning once again. I'm Tuli Urikkala from the Finnish Ministry of Finance and I will be moderating our next panel on sovereign debt. And this is obviously no small topic as we have seen already yesterday and this morning. Uh, it is safe to say it is also a topic and challenge of many countries in the world, whether rich or poor. But the nature of the challenge varies by country and today we are here to discuss sovereign debt from a developing country perspective. Shari's presentation gave us a real kickstart to the day, so thank you for that. And next we wish to hear from our panelists what they see as the emerging sovereign debt challenges in developing countries and what may be the possible solutions. Just a few words from my side to start it out. Uh, so as we have already discussed from different angles, as a legacy of the pandemic, many developing countries are left with even higher levels of sovereign debt than before. Now many of these countries are already in or risk falling into debt distress and reversing their development gains. Going forward, uh, the long-term development challenges have of course not gone anywhere either. Responding to all of these challenges and achieving economic growth will require sustainable investments and other reforms, while debt burdens need to be carefully managed. So generating growth while carefully managing debt is again a shared challenge of countries of all income levels, also our country. And on top of it all, uh, we have to remain mindful of how the, how the market does not always absorb debt quite like it has in recent years, which may reflect not only in prices, but in volumes as well. We have not discussed it that much, and this is my last point. Uh, but obviously the developed country policy shifts have an impact on developing countries too including through the financial markets. So let me now move on to introduce our speakers. Uh, with us here today, uh, we have Andrea Presbitero, Presbitero of the IMF. Uh, Andrea is currently senior economist at the IMF and CEPR research fellow in the International Macroeconomics and Finance Program. He has also held assistant professor positions in different universities, as well as published broadly in top journals. We have also Ariane Dehan from the IDRC. Uh, Ariane leads the Supporting Inclusive Growth Program at the International Development Research Center, IDRC, in Canada. He has over 20 years of experience combining research and practice in international development and public policy. And last but not least, as we always say, <laughs> Maureen, uh, Maureen Ware joins us from the Central Bank of Kenya and has worked extensively on debt in Africa. She has previously served also at WIDER and WTO and her peer-reviewed research extends from macro policy topics to gender and development. Each panelist will now have up to 10 minutes for presentations and at the end we will have a joint session of questions and answers. So if we start with Andrea, okay. uh, what do you think makes the current sovereign debt situation or even crisis different from the previous ones? So please go ahead. <coughs> thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks to uh, Kunal, Tony and everybody and the Bank of Finland and wider for, for hosting. I think it's, uh, I'm sorry I missed a part of the conference yesterday. So I guess uh, talking at dinner, I may sort of overlap on something that has already been said yesterday. But look, let me gov give you like uh, a few sort of, I have a few charts and then try to put maybe some of the things that already been mentioned including this morning in a sort of, a maybe slightly different order, but I don't know how much new things there will be. So the first thing I want to sort of point out, like as this come from ongoing work that, that we are doing at the, at the fund on sort of on, on public debt. One way of, again, looking at the same thing from a slightly different angle, you can basically, you know, the, the, the solid uh, line is the share of countries which are currently in a sort of debt surge, meaning debt is increasing for quite some time. And as you can see, if you look at this historically, that been what's been happening like now, meaning in the 2000, it's very similar sort of in terms of trend of what happened in the 70s. And what you know is that after sort of the big upsurge in debt in the 70s, there's been this big wave of restructuring vis-a-vis -vis official or private creditors. You see what is happening in the 2000, nothing has been happening, you know, this data ends in 2020, you can sort of push it 
a little bit farther to 2021, you can include the SSI and you have something, but you know, the SSI is very specific, let me come back on that. There is not much in terms of yet, in terms of restructuring and so on, and you can argue this has been driven because of like very sort of soft monetary policy, very good financing condition and so on and so forth. But you know, if history repeats itself, and we don't know if history repeats itself, but then you can argue that you know, sort of that sort of restructuring is gonna come at some point, and I guess everybody more or less is saying that uh, between yesterday and, and, and today. What happened, and again, this is again new, nothing new, but you know, if you want to compare the past from uh, with what is it is now, clearly everybody is talking about this changing radar landscape. And here is basically the total stock of public external debt for DSSI eligible countries in the last 20 years divided by creditor type. And it's, you know, generally people split party club, multilateral, and all the rest. But even within all the rest, you see that in all the rest is mostly China and bold dollars. And then the big role of sort of this emerging donor is, is, is large, and especially in some countries. Like while China is more or less a relevant creator for most of low-income countries, especially in Africa, bond dollars is much more concentrated in a few, but still, like on average, the, there is a big change. And uh, I guess that the issue already came out in sort of, you know, if you need to restructure, one thing is restructuring with like two uh, creators, meaning multilateral and bilateral, or, you know, ready plan uh, early on. Different thing is restructuring with l such a diverse pool of creators. And, you know, I guess the, the delay of the common framework uh, clearly testifies that. China is important, and so there are many, many things that one can say let's do how China can affect uh, uh, lending to developing countries, which could be the implication. Uh, I don't have the time, and the, uh, to be honest, I don't have any the expertise to go into that. Let me just point out two things. One is like very simple, if you want to look at the procyclicality of lending, we tend to argue, and there is a whole literature on, on foreign aid, in which like uh, Tony and others in the room contributed, we generally want aid to be counter-cyclical. That's what we want. And you know, if you, these are basically data from, from, from the World Bank, if you just regress aid on grow, and this could give you some sort of very rough measure of procyclicality. Paris and multilateral club tend to be uh, counter-cyclical, especially the bilateral donors. If you look at China, it's basically, if anything, is pro-cyclical. I don't know how much trust I can put in those sort of coefficients, but if anything, it clearly doesn't signal that it's not the same at Paris club. So that's one problem. The other one is like, we can look at seniority. And what is interesting here is that this is basically a replication of, of a chart that Christoph Trebesch had in a paper on, on seniority of, of creditors. And what is nice here is that if you look at China, China is the, is the red line. China tend to be like a sort of very junior say, creditor at the beginning of the period. If you look at the end of the period, it becomes like a senior creditor, very similar in some countries to sort of multilateral like the IMF and, and others. And so, Looking forward, this is joint, sort of not even work, just thinking with, uh, with, uh, with Tito Cordelli, which one could sort of think which could be the implication of having like in some countries two big creators like China and the fund, which s share very similar sort of seniority status. And this, you know, we can think of the very sort of complicated implication because of that. Then the other issue about China, there is hidden debt. People have talked a lot about that, Carmen Reinhardt and, and a lot of co uh, collaborators at the World Bank. This is basically the chart as before, uh, sort of updated to 2021 without the surges. But you know, if you're on top of the restructuring with Paris Club and private credit, you put China, and in this case also the DSSI, you can see that uh, there are already a lot of restructuring coming over together with these uh, uh, big waves of, uh, big, big sort of surges in debt. So that's another way which you can think that you know, China is special, and, and this clearly connects to all the discussion about transparency and, and sort of having uh, more information about uh, uh, outstanding debt position and, and restructurings. Then going home, why then, then if you have to restructure, I guess what is important to think is about which are the costs of, of restructuring. And there is a, lit, a large literature, again, many people, including Hugo, in, 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 uh, contributed on that. Here I want to flag like a slightly different sort of a new flavor on the discussion on the restructuring, which people don't look exactly at the economic costs, but mostly at the social costs, which I think it's, it's very nice. It's this nice paper by, by Carmen Reiner and Cotter at the World Bank, in which here basically do synthetic control, and so let's say that the dashed line is sort of an indication of how country would have gone without a sovereign default, and the solid line is how country actually gone after default. And here you can look at sort of there is economic story, there is this big gap in GDP, and on the right hand side there is a sort of the social, in this case health story, in which you know this is measure of calorie intake, they do with poverty, they do with energy consumption. 
So color intake is just so because of better data, but still, like there are large social costs from default. And I think something we should consider looking going forward. So what can people do about that? So how the international community reacted? First of all, there was been the DSSI and second of all, the G20 common framework. On the DSSI, has been mentioned in the previous presentation, like there is this discussion about is a liquidity crisis, is a, is a solvency crisis. I guess at the beginning with COVID, people rightly so thought it was a liquidity crisis. And the natural sort of uh, reaction to a liquidity crisis is like, you know, I just postponed payment. So was successful or not? We have a paper on that with, with, a, with a couple of quotas in which actually our answer is yes. So if you have a liquidity crisis, the policy response from the G20 was, yes, I postpone your serv debt service payment. I try to provide more liquidity. And in fact, what we show here is that if you look at spreads, actually spreads went down. So countries countries with access to market, which is like a subset of those countries, were able to borrow a cheaper terms because of liquidity crisis. That was, I guess, a right response if you, were, if you had like a very short shock. COVID was a long shock, so there was not like, now more is needed, and so we need more, and we need more, and there is a larger literature that tells you that, uh, again, default are, uh, are costly, and what is important is that you need to act quickly and, and you, know, you don't have to drag. I guess the experience of HIPIC and DRI tell us that dragging and, and waiting and, and kicking the can down the road has been extremely costly. And uh, we have to sort of act very fast. And you know, the SSI was fast for liquidity, but was not fast enough to sort of now go into debt relief. And the G20 common frame was not, you know, at the, at the moment is not really working. So I guess at the moment, like before, this, I guess there is an agreement about 60%, 50% of countries in debt distress. I guess it's irrelevant. It's a large number of countries which are in close to debt distress. And so action is needed. There is a lot of shock that are uh, eating those countries. You, it's been already discussed. I guess strong US dollar especially is going to be a big uh, f shock uh, for, for those countries. So reprofiling and restructuring is needed. And the common framework clearly uh, is sort of the sort of provide the framework to think about that. But much more has to be done. And, and so far, it's not been uh, particularly successful. Thank you. We're doing excellent on time. Uh, you let us with two extra minutes, actually. <laughs> so, so thank you. That was most thought-provoking. I'm sure there will be lots of questions at the end. Uh, next, uh, I will I will turn to Arjan, uh, who will share with us the main findings and policy lessons from the IDRC project on uh, debt challenges in the MENA region. So Th please go ahead. Thanks very much. You set a very high standard now. Please keep me to time, I feel. <laughs> uh, th thank you so much to, uh, to the bank and to, uh, to, to WIDER for this, uh, this event. It's a great privilege to, uh, to be here. I, uh, before I start, I just want to say that I, International Development Research Center I mean, is part of the Canadian Development Program. We're not, a, we're not a center that does research. We're a center that, that funds research in developing countries. So the right thing would have been, and Kunal has tried very hard to get Ishaq Diwan, who is leading this project here, to talk about uh, this. Uh, so I, I think economists think second best is OK. I, I don't think it's anything like that. And I'll, I'll prove that to you. The, the, the background to this, uh, so this is, I'm talking about the research that we fund, that we support. Um, uh, the, the, the background to this was IDRC funded a quite big investment with Southern think tanks in response to, uh, to COVID, like many of the donors uh, did. Uh, and, and in that period where we, we, we supported research looking at the, the, the COVID policies, and it's been very important in the discussion here already, including in the, uh, the Andes, uh, Andes uh, report, uh, is, is how the, 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 uh, the debt crisis, the debt issues came on top of the challenges that were already faced. Very important how low those respond, how, how little fiscal space there was for those responses already. And, and, and I don't think we've seen a lot of that. Many of those, those supportive policies were withdrawn within six to 12 months or something. And that, that, that was at the same time as the debt crisis was happening. So that was the background to this research. So we're supporting uh, about six country case studies in Africa. And then this uh, regional uh, commission that was led by uh, the Economic Research Forum and by, uh, by Isaac, who's both a fellow uh, and at, at both those uh, those institutions. One of the interesting papers in there, which I d definitely recommend, not not in this one, but in, in the case studies in Africa, is work on uh, on Nigeria, where where for example was looked at the how uh, the different scenarios on the which. 
uh, to go back to the beginning, or I hope that was okay to go. <laughs> um, uh, different scenarios under which debt relief could be uh, productively invested, and I'll come back to that qu question later. Um, so, so very quickly, I'll, I'll do the, the, the slides very quickly, just to make sure I do justice to the fact of the of the commission, rather than pretending it was my uh, my work. These were the, uh, the, the 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 terms of reference for a commission that looked at six countries, uh, uh, six countries in the MENA region. I'll, I'll show you the countries in a second uh, that that looked in uh, looked at, at, at the development path in in MENA as particularly in the highly indebted one, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and, and, and Tunisia. And, and they're very different, um, and, and, and Lebanon uh, is, is an extreme of that, um, how to avoid financial crisis and recessions, and what reforms are, are needed. Uh, and, and the important thing, if Isar had been here, I think he would, have, he would have taken us away from a discussion about that, because he, he looks in particular, and, and uh, Ibrahim as well, they look at Sudan and Lebanon as well, like it's the, it, it's, the, it's the political crisis, it's the fragility here, and, and the debt crisis just on top of that and and I'll, again I come back to that later is, is like the, the debt crisis you can't think about it in isolation from the broader development challenges that those countries uh, face so these are the six countries that the Commission and the report is out I, I, I highly recommend uh, reading the, uh, the the report uh, and and the two most indebted countries uh, which the report pays attention to are Lebanon and Sudan and and of course very different countries as well and the important message there is even and Isaac was telling me is like you know the, the MENA region we don't talk a lot about the MENA region but it's almost almost like a, a, an example for the rest of the world is there is each region is different but even if you take Lebanon Sudan and Egypt they're completely different stories they're all the, all three countries need restructuring but the implications of that in each country is very different and it's an obvious point but that's very important and I, I, I if I get a chance I'd, I'd really love to talk about the IMF donor conditionalities, not, not in the sense whether conditionalities are good and bad, but how they can support the needed reform. So these are the key messages from the, uh, the, 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 the Commission. The first one uh, absolutely the, uh, leads to a financial crisis. I think if you look at Lebanon, it's already there. I don't think there's a question about a, a coming financial crisis in Lebanon. It's, it's already uh, there. Very importantly, austerity only adjustment leads to a social crisis. In fact, any uh, any social peace that exists has induced the financial crisis, if you like. It's financed by uh, Lebanon, uh, of course, is already in, in a crisis. Sudan has, 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 has had a path out of fragility uh, le with, 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 with fiscal investment. So it's, 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 uh, uh, the, the adjustment needs to take account of cutting that will have huge political implications. Uh, the... Yes, the IMF program and debt workout are, are, of course, very, very important. But, uh, and I'm not just saying the IMF, and not because you're here. It's, it's the broader restructuring, right? And the point you're making is like, well, there aren't actually that many of, of them in the past. It's actually quite important. The, the debt restructuring, whoever does it, is not sufficient. It needs a national renewal plan and credible uh, enough to, uh, to ignite uh, growth. There are huge uh, growth potential. Climate finance uh, action for climate is really important in that region, of course, of course, in a very different uh, different way. But it needs uh, a modernization of the state. Uh, it, it needs and and a state that 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 adjusts to the new global uh, global issues, including uh, including the climate uh, climate crisis. And finally, that economic reforms are deeply deeply uh, political, and we know that, but. And then again, I come back to to the question. It's like, or, or uh, the, que the 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 question I also asked to to the research team, right? It's like, okay, what what are the implications of this? We all know this is the case. Uh, they are political. Uh, it needs, and and I think Shakira was talking about it. Need that kind of uh, a national dialogue, civil society with that complex of, of creditors, right? But but how does what does that then mean for the international uh, community to uh, how they uh, how how they they lead those uh, that restructuring and it needs in the MENA region, it, it sounds typical, but it isn't. It needs to generate that trust and confidence. How have I done for time so far? With time, so you have uh, four minutes left. <laughs>
the last points then that I uh, want to make four 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 things and they they're very like I said this was this is the work of of that commission I want to make sure I did justice to that the four the four issues that I that that come out for me uh, that I hope uh, that are relevant for this debate uh, one as everybody said the threat of the crisis is real I think it's already there we should probably stop talking about an imminent crisis it's already there uh, Lebanon being being the uh, the clearest example Egypt this is clear is a clear example uh, as well uh, austerity packages we need to it's about cutting expenditure austerity packages just won't do because of this this social unrest that will uh, that will follow the market impacts of course as well as social uh, social unrest I, I wonder why I'm saying this I think we've just seen this in the UK haven't we I mean the, the, the government collapsed exactly on those uh, on those issues you can't see this in, in isolation um, so the the, the important thing really to put in in the debate is that whichever that restructuring whichever the international support is given needs to mobilize that internal internal reform and that's where I come back to to the questions about conditionalities uh, conditionalities is a terrible word in many circles civil society many civil society hates the conditionalities but you need the right conditionalities in a way and 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 even the work at the imf has very clearly uh, demonstrated how hard it is for the international community to, to impose those conditionalities again to organize that restructuring in a way that organizes that uh, that reform and within that and again i come back to i think i think shakira put that very uh, very well is that that needs to be through through a broad-based consultation internationally including with the civil society because this international civil society continues rightly to put pressure on those uh, those issues but also the internal dialogue uh, of course it is it is primarily with 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 the banks with the government and in Kenya we know this as well civil society there also plays an important important role needs to be somehow involved in that debate the private sector needs to uh, needs to be part of that so it's 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 it it, it and then it, it sounds like the hippie, hippie debates in the in the two thousands, but then it's so different because of the of the, of the different nature of the of uh, the, the the different structure of uh, of that. So it's it's you know I think that's that's a that's, that's a real challenge, and you know these these processes are political, and we really need to bring those into those the, into the debate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Arian. Uh, you were also doing very well on time, so thank you and. Uh, this is really, uh, uh, we are in the, I'm thinking we are in the same, same, but different world in that the uh, structure of debt might be, might be different, but we go back to the basics where we need to have the national ownership of the reform programs to start with, to do any significant uh, reforms. But next, uh, I turn to Maureen. Uh, and Maureen will talk about the public debt crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. How large is it? What are its drivers? And why does it matter? So please, Maureen, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll opt to stand for a change. Yeah, so I was asked to talk about the, the uh, public debt in the context of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, how large is it? And what are the drivers? I think you made my life very easy because some of the issues that we've been talking since about yesterday are quite summarized as well, uh, what I'm going to talk about. However, I'll try to put this in context. And uh, one issue I would like to say is that we've been hearing about the 60% since morning, I think since from the uh, first keynote address. What I'll try to do in this presentation is to try and unpack it and conceptualize it in the context of sub-Saharan African countries. Okay, don't know why the slides are not working. Okay, there we go. So we were limited to four slides, so I'll try to summarize. So basically, uh, if you look at this chart, it, uh, what we see is that uh, debt to GDP ratios have been aging, have aged up from about 50 percent in just before the pandemic in 2019 to 57.6 in 
uh, percent in 2020 and 57 to in 2021. As you can see, there was kind of uh, uh, the ratios aged up much faster following the COVID pandemic. And in fact, if you look at these ratios excluding Nigeria and South Africa, they are much higher at about 61%. Now, one would, would argue that these are quite minimal numbers compared to what we are seeing in advanced countries. But in the context of these countries, these numbers mean a lot. And I'll come back in a, a little time. Also, averages can be misleading. So what I try to do is, let's see um, what about, this is based on the, the regional economic outlook for sub-Saharan Africa, which is very current. It came out this month. So we, we see that some of, these small, some of the countries which are actually already in debt, in debt distress are already having a government to debt GDP ratios of over 100. And if you look at these countries already, there are some of them like, uh, as I'll show you in the next chart, uh, like Zambia, Mozambique are already actually in debt distress, meaning that they're actually not even able to meet their debt obligations. In this chart, of course, we are, um, have excluded uh, South Africa, but I think uh, I had Amina comment that you are also struggling. The debt to GDP ratio is about, uh, um, I think, 67 point something percent. And we always want to exclude our big brother because sometimes uh, uh, when you talk about Sub Saharan Africa, uh, they are, these countries can be quite he heterogeneous. So here I've just presented the, the, the debt to GDP ratios and in the next chart what you see is that the, the point we've been talking about is this increased debt vulnerabilities. And as you can see from this chart, more and more countries are facing risk of debt distress. And I think all out uh, here, uh, what I put in this chart is specifically uh, sub-Saharan African countries. But of course, we have already other country, uh, countries which are already in debt distress, like Sudan. Uh, I mean, so, uh, Sudan is here, Somalia is here. But since I th those ones don't fall in sub-Saharan African countries, I excluded them. So one point is, if you look at the DSS, these are the countries that the IMF, uh, they are covered by the IMF World Bank, a DSA analysis, that is debt sustainability framework analysis of the IMF and World Bank, they cover 35 countries. And out of these 35 countries, those are like, uh, these are 35 out of 45 sub-Saharan African countries. The DSAs are publicly available for 34 countries, except I think Eritrea. And I just took the DSA just before the pandemic, and that was 2019. And the DSA, uh, as of last month, in September. And what you see is like there's this quick uh, transition. If, for example, if you take countries like, sorry, if you take countries like uh, Kenya, Malawi, just before the pandemic, they were their this debt distress was being rated as just being moderate. But they quickly transitioned and graduated to high risk. Now, if you look at uh, the low countries that are in low risk, just before the pandemic in 2019, we had Madagascar, Rwanda, Senegal, Tanzania, Uganda. In fact, Tanzania has always been regarded as this low risk debt distress, uh, low, low, low risk or at, of debt distress for quite a, a long while. But all of a sudden, they have graduated to moderate. And I think uh, what would be deceiving here is to have uh, maybe some misunderstanding, some comfort that if you are in moderate, you are comfortable. Because as you see, the transition from graduating from moderate to risk, uh, to high risk uh, category is quite, can be very fast, depending on the circumstances, and especially given the vulnerabilities. So which countries do we now have in low risk? Basically, we are not left with any. I think uh, Eritrea, we don't know where to place it because its DSA is not publicly available. 
But if you look at the sub-Saharan African countries, we are basically saying that virtually all the 35 countries that are covered by the DSA are facing some form of risk, of debt distress risk, be it moderate, be it high, or actually in actual debt distress. And if you look, uh, if you take these countries out of the total 45 countries, then these countries make three quarters, so basically about 76 percent. And if you take countries that are in debt distress and they are high risk of debt distress, they constitute 40 percent of the 45 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So that tells you just how vulnerable uh, the entire continent or oh, this region is facing. And if you, of course, combining this with the entire the other countries in the northern uh, MENA region. So what I, I think uh, the presentation that we just had by, by my colleagues uh, talked about, uh, the and also what we've been hearing since morning is the composition of the debt and how this has changed, and what this has, uh, the point that I wanted to make is, I think what was made by the, the panelists before we, our panel, that the cost of servicing debt has really gone up. And just to show, I just took this uh, as an example from uh, Kenya's case. So if you look at the increased cost of debt servicing associated with the increase in the private and commercial debt, so you see that, uh, almost uh, uh, like 68% six, six, of the interest payments go, are going to bilateral or commercial debt. And only, uh, we are the only small proportions, of course, go to the multilateral. So what that, what that shows is this, uh, whereas the composition of commercial debt has gone up almost to about a third, then it comes with the high costs of of servicing. And so, how did we get here? Or how did these countries get where they are right now? There have been quite some factors that have been developing over time. And as I said, how many minutes do I have? Okay. So, I'll try to summarize this. And the key drivers of this public debt uh, that we are seeing has been increased investment demand for infrastructure development. If you look at uh, most of these countries, either they are, like my own country, we have had the, the standard gauge railway, most of these countries have had in, uh, this massive investment in infrastructure, we have the roads, the energy, and this is where the China factor comes in. Most of these have been through large-scale financing from Chinese loans, and part of the, uh, that's what uh, has taken us where we are. And then there was also this increased ability to borrow following the improved macroeconomic management and strong economic performance, particularly um, since the 2000. And also the HIPIC debt relief. What this did, especially for the HIPIC countries, was to provide an ample space for borrowing because uh, it, it substantially lowered their public debt burden. But what, has, what that done is that when they went to this borrowing spree, they have ended up again like in a crisis where they almost found themselves before. And then we had come the financial crisis and we had these favorable global financing conditions when uh, the advanced countries, uh, starting of course with the US, lowered their interest rates almost to zero or zero. And then there were also, favorable rating following the favorable economic uh, uh, growth that was going on, if you recall that time we had this, the Africa rising narrative. So most of these countries took advantage of the favorable interest rates to go and to the international market and issue for sovereign bonds. And then we came, we, before we before we'd know what's uh, happening, I think it's been said that just before the pandemic, already these countries' uh, debts were already going up. But the, we all know that the, we had this adverse impact of the COVID pandemic, which had two double effects on revenues, 
because of the lockdown uh, measures and all this, and also the growth that most countries recorded negative growth rates, and this had really uh, a severe impact on them. And then what you are seeing is a U-turn. Remember, I talked about the favorable uh, financial conditions, but now what you are seeing with the increases, uh, interest rate hikes in the advanced economies, the interest rates in the international markets have gone up. My own country, uh, last month, wanted to issue a sovereign bond, but we could not because of these uh, high rates. So we are seeing a situation where countries are actually now being kept out again, and also facing high rollover effect, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, costs because uh, most of these uh, bonds are actually approaching maturity. There are some that are going to mature in the near future, and we, we expect even this uh, cost of servicing to go high. So we see a situation where countries are even borrowing to, again, finance or to pay debts. So it becomes like a vicious circle. I think uh, Amrisk's presentation, you talked about this high dependency on commodities. We've been hearing about this. And this makes uh, these countries very vulnerable, ex also to the exchange rate shocks. Uh, as we speak, uh, we know that the, the, the dollar has been strengthening. So the debt, uh, most of these uh, countries have seen their currencies depreciate. Over 50% of their uh, foreign debts are in U.S. dominated. So what this means is that the cost, cost, cost of, uh, of their debt goes up even without uh, doing anything much. And then, of course, there's these issues of maturity mismatches because most of these countries that have borrowed even to finance this infrastructure development, we know this comes with... Um, a lag when it comes to revenue generation. And we don't see that. Uh, so you are borrowing short term, and your revenue streams are in domestic currents, and they have long gestations before you get the, feed, the fruits of it. And then you have these loans that you have to, 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 to kind of uh, pay back or uh, service quite quickly. So because of that, you have to again borrow because you, your revenues are not matching what you borrowed. Then you have this fragility, country, fragile countries, which characterize with civil strife and fragility of some of the some of these economies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I've not taken. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, now uh, your insights uh, bring us uh, directly to the questions and answers session. And uh, actually, I would like to start out while <laughs> others might still contemplate their questions. I might wish to start with one myself uh, and, and you can choose if you want to respond. <laughs> so <laughs> my question is, uh, what do you think needs to be done to improve future debt restructuring processes? And how do you see the role of the private sector in this? So if anyone would like to comment. Silence. No, I can, I can, yes, I can thank start. You. I guess... <coughs> It's probably the harshest question, but also the one that uh, I guess everybody was expecting. I, I don't know, like I think it's, it's very complicated and, and to some extent the fact that, you know, the common framework started like a year and a half ago and we have three countries which uh, sort of apply to that and, and they're going through that like very slowly for, I guess, in part like domestic condition and in part, like, really issue related to co create or coordination. So I guess in the session before, there's been something has been mentioned. There's a lot of discussion how one can bring uh, creators to, to the table. And, and I guess it's, uh, I guess, on that, I guess, the, the role for sort of, as has been mentioned before, like civil society mm -hmm. and a lot of pressure from, from, from bilaterals and multilaterals is, uh, is, is incredibly in, uh, important, I think. And so sort of my... I, my take on that, and um, again, I should have said at the very beginning, this is my own personal view, it doesn't reflect the view of the institution, <laughs> especially now, is that I, I thought, like, when COVID came, you know, we, we knew that there was a lot of problems, and I guess she said, made a very good point in saying that many of the, many our countries, especially in Africa, issued sovereign bonds, and this was very risky and exciting. We know that there are this incredible bullet repayment coming due 2023, 2024. This is all known before COVID. So we knew that, yeah. that the stress was very high. I was working in Senegal 
and, and Senegal was performing very well, it's grow very fast, but still like that service is an issue exactly because of sovereign bonds. And it's not like, you know, I'm Italian, you know, so, so we know about debt problems. <laughs> but you know, if, if you are Italy, like you issue a lot and then you know, you're a lover, it's not an issue, no, you don't care, you know, keep on rollovering as long as the debt management office works, it's one thing. If you have like two bonds outstanding, rolling over of that is a big issue because you know, if liquidity goes down, it's just what happened, like with now, it's not there, Kenya is not able to issue in the market, Senegal, yes, but who knows in a year time. So that was a risk ex ante that, that we knew. COVID came and, and, and to me, like, for the hippie, we went to that relief with a lot of time and with a lot of push, like from everyone, from the pop to Bono. And, and to some extent, I don't <laughs> know if it's good or bad, but we ended up in providing that relief, okay? Hmm. Now, it seems to me that the political okay. case is easier. Because with hippie, you know, you can have a lot of counter arguments and say, you know, those countries did mistakes and they overborrowed and I don't want to take stance, but you know, you can have good arguments on both cases. Now it's really pure exogenous shocks. Mm. So I guess politically there should be much more sort of unity in sort of providing sort of, you know, debt relief or reprofiling or restructuring. So I guess mm -hmm. that there is a lot of scope to do that and I'm kind of I'm kind of disappointing that it's taking so long. And my point is the presentation is that it's it's very costly to wait, and mm. sort of the cost of waiting, it's, it's, it's to increasing over time, and, and, and it's now two years. Yeah. Thank Maybe you. Maybe it was a long question. Thank you very much. Answer. Yeah, so I'll start from where I just ended. I think what, what's been challenging in this case compared to what we saw in the, with the HIPIC issue is that uh, this multi, multi, multiplicity of the creditors so the question is, uh, for example, the commercial debt, how do you uh, then approach them and how do you be able to bring them on table so that you're not only talking about uh, the Paris club members or as, as it was before. And I think for me, what, what, what is needed is the international coordination of this. Um, I, I, I think that, that if, if we had more of uh, that, that coordination, it's easier to, uh, I mean, approach it holistically and put, uh, so we, ha we have both uh, domestic, uh, where we are involving the civil societies and the private sector, but internationally we, ha we must see that coordination uh, coming in uh, quite strongly for this to happen, because uh, if we don't have that, then we are seeing a situation where like, every country is just left to fight for itself. Mm. and. I mean, God for us all, uh, kind of uh, approach. Yep. And the other thing is, uh, yeah, yesterday there was a question that um, that was asked, like, why are some of these countries shying away, for example, for approaching the, the, the G20 common framework uh, for restructuring? I, I mean, it's also this stigma that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Because you go for the debt restructuring, you given bad ratings, and then it all kind of uh, makes your situation even look more gloomy. And then, you know, everybody then shuns away from you. And so I don't know, like that issue of how we need to give these countries, and that's why we need this uh, co coordinated international response, so that you are not like like uh, almost uh, feeling isolated or humiliated that you are going mm -hmm. for this, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes it looks like, okay, if countries go for debt restructuring, then their credit ratings, it means like they're doing so awful that now nobody wants to hear about them. And in fact, what, what has happened even for those countries that have gone there, what happens is that their interest rate spreads. I, I mean, it goes just hayway, I mean, because I mean, it means like, so you, what you are doing, you are actually doing more damage to these countries. Mm. So we need to manage that in a way that can give confidence. Thank you, Maureen. And Arian, you want to add something? Y yes, yes, and, and when I, I, I agree that the two previous speakers were concerned, there's the yes, but, that <laughs> there is a, there's <laughs> such a big, and, and I, mean, I was trained as a historian, and I almost feel like, like, like we should absolutely stop talking about HIPIC. The world is so different now that the lessons from that, apart from it's costly to delay, that's absolutely a critical question. It is just the situation is too different. We need, and this was a, we need that international coordinated response, but it's not the same as it uh, as, as it used to uh, used to be. The fact that those debt restructuring are not happening is 
perhaps because there isn't an international commitment, but I don't think that's where the problem lies. It is because countries are pushing back. It's like the way that the debt restructuring is presented does not fulfill their need. Ethiopia, I heard that one of the research work in Ethiopia, is like I read the IMF statement on Ethiopia back in June, it's like, well, restructure will come, like, will come. And, and the IMF team was in town again. It's like, it's not coming. Why? We don't 100% know. And that's why we need to, uh, need to figure, uh, figure this out. Within that, I, I, I do want to bring in a very important differentiation because there's a lot of, uh, and in Maureen's slide as well, right, that, that, that it, it, the private sector isn't that important in all countries. In many of the countries, you have the previous situation, if you like, if you take uh, Sudan, for example, I think Sudan, that's all multilateral debt still, and, and many, in many of the countries you list there as well. So there you have a situation where the international coordination does work, but in the others, it, it doesn't, countries are putting back. And bringing the private sector into the picture is, is, is absolutely critical, both at the international level, but also then, that, that also needs to, and that's where the hippie kind of discussion just are not suited for this situation. And to, to build that national ownership, civil society is important, but, but there at that level too, this uh, private sector needs to be brought in much more strongly than, than we've, uh, we, we, we've, ever, uh, we've ever seen. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's move on to questions uh, from the audience. I think I saw Ika here first. Uh, thank you. Uh, very fascinating uh, uh, interventions, all three. I have a comment and a question, and the comment is first to, to Andrea on I'm not surprised that the Chinese lending appears to be pro-cyclical. It's supposedly, I mean, aid. Huh. Chinese uh, development banks lending to big infrastructure projects, which often go to Chinese contractors, and they sort of Almost by defi definition, they, they create growth. Uh, and then actually continue on this, I have a question to, to Maureen on now that the Chinese banks and, and some other companies are big lenders in, in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And you mentioned that uh, some countries are now in even greater difficulties in servicing their debt. Uh, do you have any sense of what is the approach of, of, of China and Chinese actors in this when if countries need to reschedule their payments and so on? That, that would be interesting to hear. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I suggest we take the questions uh, one by one so that we don't uh, forget what we had <laughs> as the first. So uh, please go ahead. Who wants to start? Okay. So, yeah. So we had the DS DSSI and the debt suspension initiative which uh, we did uh, have a chance for to restructure the Chinese uh, loans as well I mean uh, debt servicing as well but that is how far it went and uh, I think uh, there has been all these views about uh, whether DSSI was effective it was not effective but I think as Andreas I mean mentioned it was supposed to be short term and it served its purpose to be short term but what, is, what has happened is that it's like denying maybe someone uh, postponing the, the, the payments, but when they accumulate, you still have to pay them. And I think that's where our challenge is, uh, comes, and this is where most of these countries are. So there was that limited breathing space, but we, we are seeing now a situation where they have to pay either way. And that's where now the restructuring comes in. It's been a bit, um, I mean, uh, this is why we, we, we say that, uh, as he says, it's quite different because then it would be much easier if we were talking about like, it's like more of every country on its own because then every country, of if you have, you have to have a, a negotiation with the, with, the, with the creditor, in this case, the big creditor being China, and I think every case is like being handled in its own merit. So you, we are hoping that we can see more of this uh, happening. But it's still challenging at the moment. Andrea, you wanted to add something? No, I think she no. answered already. Like I guess the, the issue on, on, I know there's, um, there are case studies in different countries. I, I guess it makes a big difference like uh, in the relative way that China or other emerging donors have in the country. So if, if 
exactly the, there's a point I was making about seniority. It's like if it's such a big lender and it's sort of behaving like senior, then you have two senior in one country and you know, and then the IMF cannot lend in arrears. So it's complicated. Mm -hmm. If it's a tiny, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a problem. But I guess that now it's more the discussion is mostly on, on, on interest and not on, on, on net NPV reduction, mm -hmm. which I guess that's, that's what holds the, 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 the common framework. Okay. Thank you. And the uh, first question came from Ika Korhonen at Bank of Finland. Please, next uh, speakers, introduce yourself because we might have someone online who was not with us yesterday. I think next I had Ugo. Hi, Ugo Panitsa from uh, the Geneva Graduate Institute. So I, uh, I don't know, a, a, co a comment slash question and an anecdote. <laughs> so let me start with the, the anecdote. So now this uh, too little, too late is, you know, the fund says it. So it was actually an official policy document of the fund, so not even it's Andrea is like in the fund position. The anecdote is that for saying this in 2006, I almost got fired. So things, uh, so I was called in the office of the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, and they told me you cannot write this stuff, it's irresponsible and blah, blah, blah. So. Uh, things have changed a lot, uh, so which is good, but we still don't understand why these defaults uh, came come too little and too late, and that's uh, that's my comment slash question. That is like a, a a big area for research, which has massive policy important because, like Andrea said, like everybody said, this is uh, this amplified the cost of this event. Thank you, Hugo. Would anyone like to reflect directly on this? Why do we have too little too late? Why we still have too little too late? Yeah, maybe Please. like one, one way of thinking is that, uh, apart from the anecdote that I hope is like orthogonal to me, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I think it, and, but I guess it, the first thing I think I would notice like sort of to move away from a very negative view to a more positive mm. view, that things really changed a lot in, in 15 years. I guess like the attitude, especially to mul from multilaterals to debt relief is way different than it used to be. But in, on the too little too late, I think thinking more as, in a sort of a, as a research than a sort of from a policy perspective, I think there is a lot of role for research here to push. Like if you go back again to the sort of the Krugman papers and, and the old papers, you know, we know that econo in, in economic terms, it makes sense under certain conditions for creditors and debtors to provide debt relief. Th there is a very solid economic argument, which apparently is not pushed that much. And so I guess that would, should be the argument that people should push. And, and I, I don't see that, and people should go back and, and read like the old, uh, sort of the Krugman and the Sachs and the other paper at the time, Dooley. There's a lot of literature on that in, in, the, in the 80s, and, and, and I guess that and more, maybe more is needed now. And the other one, if I can react to what she said about the stigma thing, like for instance, mm. in our, in mm -hmm. our DSSA pa DSSI paper, we were really motivated by, fact, by that and by the fact that, you know, credit rating agency were saying, oh yeah, if you, if you apply for the DSSI, okay. mm. you're, gonna, you're gonna be destroyed. Um, in, in the reality, no, we, we really say that there was no stigma attached to that. And, uh, and, and if, you know, in, in, as a sort of an anecdote, in the slides we have that, you know, we, we start with a quotation from a Minister of Finance uh, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm not sure it's Kenya, it could be, uh, and then uh, saying that, oh yeah, we're not going to apply because it's, there is stigma attached to that, it's going to be costly. And then after our paper, but you know, it's uncorrelated to that, but still it's... Uh, it's there, then they say, oh, yes, we're gonna apply, and in fact, there is no stigma. And, and we have, there is no stigma, and, and so one can provide the research and try to sort of show that it's gonna be the case. And even, even for the common framework, if, if it starts in a certain way, and there is gray, and there is sort of agreement, then, then stigma goes down. Stig there is stigma is endogenous. There is stigma because it's not working. The moment it works, stigma goes out. Mm. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah I, w I wanna underline that, I think, I mean, it's the end of this session. Too little, too late, I, I think, is, is you know, I'm not going to leave this meeting with, with, with that conclusion uh, uh, because it's not the right thing to, to be negative. There are problems that the international community has to contribute to. And, and I also, I don't, I don't think it's, it, it, it's, it's actually accurate. Uh, everybody has been commenting on this was coming. I mean, uh, ARC in, in Nairobi has been, you know, has been, this publication three years ago has been, you know, and then COVID came, and so so I, I don't think there's a a, a terrible slow uh, slow response. I I think the important thing and the stigma is is really important in this is is is, is to to really think how 
ha how the international community and support has uh, has changed. You, you heard me probably muttering when China was mentioned. So like, like we just have to get used that that's how the world has changed. That it isn't the same as the, as it was, and that what the international community, what IMF IMF does, they now have to, as they do, as the, gov the national governments will do, will take account of like the actions that with the IMF will have impact on our credit rating, will have an impact on all sorts of other things. We have to work with that entire uh, entire community. So, so I, I think. Realizing that the old donor community is less and less important. That is happening very gradually and I think much too much too slowly. We should be much more upfront and clear about that and reflect that in our international international debates. But that's you know, let's let's not then come to the conclusions like, oh, we didn't respond to, to this crisis uh, in time. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I still have at least Shakira, Tony and Sanjay. So uh, please, Shakira. Um, just a comment and a question. I'm uh, sorry, please introduce oh, sure. yourself to uh, the... Shakira Mustafa, I'm a researcher at ODI. One of the things we've looked at quite in depth at is um, Chinese debt restructuring process. And I think people really underestimate how fragmented a lender China is. So it's just one person making the decision for this is how we're going to treat all debts. So zero interest loans have a higher probability of being cancelled. And the more con commercial the no loan is, the, the less scope there is for debt relief. And I think uh, the previous panel yesterday, they mentioned this, someone mentioned this person, issue of personal liability. If it's your loan in, the, in the, that Chinese agency that's prob problematic and it's canceled, that has reputational effects for you and it basically could end your career. And that personal liability element that some people don't, from the outside don't really take into account. So that's that comment. Uh, and please, you know, check ODI for if you want to read, learn more about the Chinese restructuring process. Um, the second question I had, given the reputational effects of things like the DSSI, the Common Framework, uh, we know there's a lot of focus in using contractual clauses to facilitate debt restructuring and temporary relief, specifically things like a natural disaster clause. If a country has a certain shock that's defined in the contract, debt service payments will be, will be suspended for one or two years. Uh, that's an idea that's been around for a very long time and hasn't really taken off for a variety of reasons. The most recent IMF publication seems to say it only is feasible for small island development states facing large exogenous shocks. Mm -hmm. So my question for Andrea is really like, what's your opinion on these state contingent clauses? And if, you, if you're a fan of it, what do you think the role of the IMF would be? Thank you. Thank you. So straight to Andrea. Yeah, very quickly on, on, on the first phase, on, on the first comment on, on China. Yeah, it's true. It's very complicated. And it's also true that, you know, there is an issue of transparency that, you know, it's, it's both on the lender and on, on the borrower as well. So, you know, if, if, if you are like then a multilateral, really in some countries, we don't have a clue of where they're borrowing from. And, and for, for, for some specific bond, it's difficult to have information. And, and, you know, the fact that you look at, you know, a lot of researchers coming up with data on, on exposure or uh, stock of external debt versus China, and you get very different numbers. And people like, you know, scraping website and whatever. So, and to me, like, it, it's so something, I guess Anna Gelber made the point that, you know, this is basically uh, obligation you have versus your citizen, and so there should be the maximum transparency, and I guess that's a big issue which is not really addressed. On, on, on the state contingent, I guess, I, not surprisingly, a view similar to what Hugo said yesterday, that to me, like, it's a, it's a big puzzle in the sense that some of these instruments seem to be like uh, uh, very low hanging fruit, and they're not there. I understand the counter argument that you know there could be a lot of manipulation, especially in some countries. It goes again to the trans data transparency, quality of data, and so you ca you can play around with a lot of stuff. But uh, for instance, I was discussing, and that goes again similar to a point that she raised about, like, uh, for instance, like. Uh, the strength of the dollar and, and the currency mismatch, and a lot of that comes with sort of a, a devaluation of, of local currency, and, and so that build up. One issue could be that you can edge currency risk issuing like ex ante instrument, and, and there could be effort from the multi I know that there is a lot of ongoing discussion in the multilateral community to develop instrument that sort of through which country can issue and, and then immediately edge, and that would be like an a similar way of doing something in which you try to solve the problem ex ante rather than ex post. And for instance, like why it's very easy sort of to tweak GDP data to sort of get around sort of state contingent debt related to GDP. But you know, it, in, on, because it's not observable, like exchange rates are observable. 
daily. And so if you think that's something going on, you can you know, reprice. And so I guess that's maybe an area in which the market can, can work better. Thank you. Uh, we are soon running over time, but I suggest we still uh, take Tony and Sanjay, uh, if, if nobody objects. <laughs> so <laughs> there you um, go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tony Anderson <laughs> from uh, Copenhagen University, and you knew wider. Um, so we know that when you're designing an adjustment or a stabilization program, if you have generous external assistance, including debt relief, then that really helps you mitigate the social and economic costs, as Andrea um, pointed out, um, simply because you will have more fiscal space and more opportunities to put in social protection and other good things. But what if we don't really have that generous external assistance? In other words, if we don't have that effective international response which people are calling for, so, so here I'm, I'm being rather cynical about the reactions of the international community because, you know, quite a lot of the, of the aid effort now is basically pro-cyclical, pro not just China. You look at, say, the United Kingdom where um, aid has, has basically become pro-cyclical, in my view. So what, do, what the question for the panel is then, in the absence of, you know, the really the effective international responses that we've all been talking about in this meeting, what do you advise the Minister of Finance or the Central Bank Governor or the policymakers in general to do? Uh, that's not an easy one, but why don't we start now from Arjan? Would you like to comment? Right. Before lunch or after? Yes. <laughs> after we can after. continue over the lunch, of course. <laughs> Uh, I, I, uh, just because we're running into lunch, that, that's, that's too much. But, but, but absolutely think about how the world has changed. I mean, if I, there's one thing I would be critical of, would be the president of the World Bank that, that back in May suddenly was so surprised when he discovered how much China's lending there was and, and, and how little this was known. David Dollar in tw 2007 in Beijing would have told you that. I, 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 the, 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 I mean, I, I haven't seen the ODI work, but that, that's exactly the kind of stuff that we need to incorporate. It's like, yes, it is different. You don't you don't have the impact that Bono had in, in, in 2000. So you won't have that international international response. But, but, but much more importantly, th that entire story is, is so far less important. We've, we've, you know, we've got to, 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 to live with that new, uh, with that new re reality. It's like that, that graph is just mind boggling how little debt restructuring there has been. The, the official ones, mm. right? The, the, the old multilateral world, if you like, whether it's Ferris Cup, IMF, doesn't matter, it's far less important. So, so, so you know, that's the new reality. I mean, again, it's very different in different countries, right? There's a couple of countries, uh, fr fragile countries, where there hasn't been that, that pro cyclical investment. It's a bit more of the old, uh, old world. I think that's still very workable, uh, workable there. But in the, in the new one, don't, don't, don't rely on the stuff we did 20 years ago. Thank you. Maureen, would you like to Yeah, go so next? now that I work in Central Bank, maybe I'm going to be advised. But <laughs> 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 Okay, but on a more serious note, yeah, yeah. So um what what countries are doing is um to do uh, of course uh, peop now if I I talk in the case of my own country uh, to do the physical consolidation. And uh, of course, this comes with a cost. So costs cannot, the social cost cannot be avoided. So somehow you must feel it because um, we are having a situation where your physical space is limited. And so you have to kind of see, uh, try to do the best you can within your limited space. And that cost, actually uh, already we are, uh, working towards that and um, that comes as i said comes with some painful uh, because uh, how do you then uh, in these economies and like advanced economies where we have for example the social protection uh, schemes unfortunately in our case uh, we have this large informal sector and most people are just survive uh, live hand to mouth 
So you also, even when the government wants to, for example, provide these social protection or safety nets, it's limited. I'll give you an example uh, with this current inflation. And we, for example, we've been having um, fuel prices going up. And we used to have, we have had a situation where to, to at least uh, provide some, some cushion the, the, the vulnerable groups. The government has been trying to provide some fuel subsidy. But as we speak, we, it's come to a situation where I think the government has realized this is not sustainable, especially in the current circumstances. So somehow, of course, uh, the, uh, you have to, to, to devise a way in such a way that you now prioritize your expenditures, try to uh, prioritize expenditures where more would benefit, uh, where you, you think that at least you can be able to safeguard, not so much to a larger scale, but at least where you can be able to make sure that uh, uh, the social spending is not so much uh, adversely affected. Um, consolidation also means that perhaps some of these development expenditures, the big whatever, may have to slow down, and this is some of the costs that these countries have to, to live with. Having said that, I would say that uh, African countries are very resilient. And Africans are very resilient, they are very hardworking people. If you look at how uh, these economies have emerged from the pandemic, without much of the, the kind of social uh, protection and support that we saw in advanced economies, um, 2021, uh, on average, sub-Saharan African countries grew by 4.7%, I think, uh, based on uh, IMF report that had just been released. My own country, they just had a growth rate of 7.5%. And if you look at how, uh, where they are coming from, I mean, it, uh, it was, the situation was quite uh, there, not so much support. So on a positive note, uh, these economies are quite resilient, and uh, thanks to the hardworking uh, mm. spirit or where you have to wake up and find where you're going to put bread on the table the following day, I think that uh, we still emerge out of it stronger. Thank you, Maureen. That's such a positive note. I'd still like to give it to Andrea and Sanjay. So. Uh, uh, oh, in eight days of time, I think she said way better than I should have said. But I think Tony's question, it's very good in the sense it brings us back to sort of to the basics and to some extent contradicting myself before. Like <laughs> it's, it's true that it's true that this can that, you know, the environment is such that there's, I really don't see a positive shock. I just see a lot of negative shocks and including like, you know, foreign aid for political reasons. Why, you know, advanced economies should increase budget for foreign aid. There is never be political support domestically, you know, so. And, and, and therefore, like, you know, that, that exactly leads to fiscal consolidation. And I guess, like, in that report, uh, I guess there's some sort of calculation of, like, you know, how much countries should consolidate to bring that back to 70% or for the other sort of to stabilize that. And I guess that's, that's I think, where we should go. And, and ongoing work that we've been doing is exactly sort of which sort of which are the best way to consolidate and sort of a little bit, like, on the fiscal side and mostly, like, through grow, like, the experience tells us the only way to reduce that is through grow and, and African being more resilient and, and still, you know, it's true that the African narrative is the old, old now, but still countries are growing and some of them, especially East Africa, but also West Africa. So I guess that's, that's where uh, sort of that stabilization can come. Okay, thanks a lot. And the final word from Sanjay, please. My question should be very short and it's directed to Andrea. Uh, <coughs> to small questions. First is that you kind of ex mentioned Krugman's, <coughs> some of the excellent papers in the 80s, but I remember kind of, uh, again, from the memory, I could be wrong, that is um, one of the main assertions of Krugman was that uh, there are, you know, lots of private debt restructuring, like, you know, debt buybacks or debt equity swaps, okay? Now, you can all replicate it by a simple debt forgiveness, okay, so that like if the IMF or kind of one central body 
just confine kind of gauges, a very simple principle, then it could be all replicated. So my first question is that, it has been almost uh, 30, 40 years since Krugman's uh, paper. So and there have been a lots of private, you know, data restructuring mechanisms have been kind of uh, floated. So do you think, in the hindsight, Krugman was right, that is, uh, there's not much of a, uh, you know, there's a lots of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, bills and jingles about that uh, private data restructuring, but actually, a simple mechanism would have been better. That's the number one. And number two question is that, like, you know, you, I know that is a complicated. You mentioned it a number of times. That is the China's role as a kind of a senior kind of a creditor. Now, so it, if I understand that, it is almost kind of equivalent to a bank debt, right? Because in a multiple creditors, bank debt would be always the senior. So when it comes to the restructuring. So the senior data actually kind of, uh, he, once he or she kind of gets the money, he leaves the scene. So it doesn't have much of an incentive to restructure debt. So is it the, that kind of a complications that you're kind of referring to, that is China is taking all his, uh, all their dues and leaving the scene and having the debt restructuring process in incomplete and messy situation? These two questions. Thank you, and over to Andrea. Yeah, for... quickly, like uh, maybe yeah. we can talk more over lunch, but I guess yes. the, the issue on, on, on China and, and seniority could simply be that, you know, in the, in the end, if you want China to participate, so meaning that being less senior and, and take the hit, then for instance, one way of thinking about that could be like uh, also thinking about the governance of, or international institutions more generally. So if you want China to participate, and so and then, then you want also, then that should be reflected in so how much weight they have in the institution. So it's, so sure there is an issue of equity here that 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 could be sort of so uh, to make I think that complicates the the issue and on 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 that relief and how complicated it is and if it can be replicated I don't know like one first reaction is that you know after hippie where it was like you know we provide common reduction to everybody and institution be criticized because you know we have to tailor things to country needs and now it's tailored to country needs country by country but then we know that if you go country by country it's very complicated because you know Kenya has to negotiate with some people and some others negotiate with some other people so I don't know like going in sort of m something more common and sort of homogeneous I guess it's it, we are not in that situation if we can afford to do that so that that's by construction more complex Thanks. well thank you Andra I'd like to end on a positive note of uh, national ownership, <laughs> a positive view on growth, resilience, yeah. and so forth. And we'll continue from here during the lunch. Thank you. Thank you. I was very glad that you said that. Right? <laughs>